Hello and welcome to the First Time Founders Podcast, the show where we talk about how to start a business from nothing and grow it into something meaningful. Today I'm speaking with Alan Williamson. Alan's a really well-regarded CTO that works with private equity organizations, typically buying founder-led businesses at the sort of 10 million up to 100 million in sales mark. So serious companies, but that because they were born as entrepreneurial outfits, often led by non-technical founder CEOs, sometimes will have let's say a little bit of technical debt that needs to be um, paid off for the new owners as they come in when they think about growing the business two, three, 10 times to achieve their growth and exit aspirations with that business. Alan's book, Think Like a CTO, is an absolute Bible for first-time founders, particularly non-technical founders, when it comes to understanding how to inspire and hold accountable a technical team, what are best practices around... um, development processes, disaster recovery, documentation, vision. It's really, really worth reading. Um, I met Alan because I read the book and reached out to him and said, my God, I wish I'd read this book before I founded my first software company. So I hope you enjoy. I hope you learned something. I certainly did. Without further ado, my conversation with Alan Williams. Alan, welcome to the First Time Founders Podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. My honor, Rob. Looking forward to it. So, Alan, we, of course, have become friends since I read your book, um, Think Like a CTO, and shamelessly reached out to you on LinkedIn to, to tell you how I wish I'd read this book before I founded my company. Um, what made you write the book? For the exact same reason you picked it up. I mean, it was it was truly that I wish I had that guide when I first went into being a CTO because I was somewhat thrown in at the deep end. I had a great mentor that helped me and made sure I wasn't going to mess it up but fundamentally if i was a ceo or a cfo even a salesperson i had a ton of books looking at me all giving me different pieces of advice even running an engineering team there's a lot of good advice but at the cto level crickets tumbleweeds pick your metaphor there was nothing right and all of the sort of useful articles that would be out there were so friggin high level and watery they had no detail whatsoever. So it was kind of one of those. And when I started asking around, I discovered that everybody had their own quite varying definition of what a CTO did, but there was a common thread amongst them all. And with my years of working with different technical leaders in the private equity space, etc., I was seeing definitely common threads whereby an engineer, usually the most senior engineer in a, in a department or a company, was elevated to the point of where we'll give you the CTO title. And, 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 but nobody actually told them, well, what do you actually do for that CTO title? It sounds impressive. It's nowhere near as impressive as the other titles, let's be honest. I mean, it doesn't help you pick up women in a bar. <laughs> it's not that sort of title because people look at you, CTO. I don't even tell my hairdresser when she says, oh, what is it you do? I'm in computing because if I say I'm a CTO, nothing. So it's not one of the sexier titles in the corporate world for sure. Uh, And ironically, (laughs) depending on which level of of organization you're in, a CTO is actually the chief transformational officer. If you get in, say, like a McKinsey or or, or one of the big four, uh, they call CTOs transformational officers, which have nothing to do with technology. It's more change management. Uh, But anyway, so from my perspective, I could see a lot of problems that each of these engineering leads were having as they they lived and breathed the role of being the technical leader for a company. And most of my role at that point was helping them sort of focus and get them to say getting getting a technical vision out, laying down a roadmap, getting a lot of the housekeeping stuff that as developers... We don't find sexy. We just, they're they're irritations, to be honest with you. But it's what's required to run a large engineering team and to run a large organization whereby the rest of the company depends on your output. So you don't get the luxury of, you know, duct taping it and and, and stringing it together. You kind of have to get this stuff right. You you, you know what made me laugh when I read the book is it clearly was written to bring CTO, wherever, you know, a technical leader is in their career. As you read your book, you can 
it was it was quite fun actually reading because you sort of in, you know you you inhabit inhabit the body of a CTO for the time that you're reading the book. But I couldn't every line that I read, I was thinking, my God, this book is 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 written for founders of non technical founders of software businesses. Um, and of course, you say early in in the book when you talk a bit about your own biography, you do a lot of work in private equity where you're coming in typically to um, first generation buyers of entrepreneurial yes. led companies. Can you talk a little bit about what it's typically like when you go into a company that's just been acquired and has been run for the last 10, 15 years by entrepreneurial misfits, usually led by a non-technical founder? Yeah, and I mean and, and and there's no blame here, there's no there's no fault that's had. I mean, it's 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 really down from an organic growth of a very excitable entrepreneur that has this vision has found this space in the market and is desperate to run after it and solve the problem now historically they may not be a technical based person so for them they've probably gone and hired somebody <laughs> a lot of the times it's it's the guy that they live next door to or somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that has a son that just graduated or you couldn't go and help him with a, just knocking up a web page of some sort and and that poor guy has and, and i use guy in an asexual manner because sometimes girls are in here too etc it is predominantly a male dominated industry that's that's the, the the reality of it is trying to get more in but that person has been sort of evolved with the evolution of the company but they have no real external help themselves because they're brand spanking new too, learning and evolving. So what you get is a lot of the stuff you look at and you're thinking, huh, well, on paper it shouldn't work, but you seem to have made it work. And then when you have a detailed conversation with them during due diligence, you realize it doesn't actually work. <laughs> <laughs> it does fall off more fall off more often than it doesn't but that's okay they have made a business and they've made a successful business with it so celebrate the fact that they got there our job now is to help get rid of a lot of the overhead and technical debt that they've incurred by simply going after a problem without the right knowledge or the right experience to be able to say Am I solving a problem or have I created myself more <laughs> problems in the process of it, even though the business still thinks they're getting what they need? What level of revenue would they usually have got to by the time you come in with a buyout crew? Anywhere between 10 to 100 million. Right. So like they have built software that's powerful. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like really Completely. Is it, is it sometimes astonishing? Like two, 300 people's salaries are dependent on this company's output. These are not small one or two man shops. Don't get me wrong. And 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 the and the team that they've evolved around them, uh, again, this this is probably an engineer's fault most of the time. But an engineer generally doesn't hire somebody smarter than they are. Right. So what happens is that the the guy that thinks he knows everything, the people under him, they're in a worse state than he is because he, he thinks he's the master of the whole enterprise. Uh, but he's missing key parts of his knowledge. So therefore, everybody underneath can't actually even ask him to fill out their knowledge. Anyway, it becomes a hodgepodge of stuff. Not everybody's like that, but that is mostly in the majority of it because the founders have been running hard, grabbing market share, creating a business, creating a stuff. They haven't had the time nor the experience to be able to say, stop we need to refactor or we need to rewrite we need to retool it's it's just kind of evolving 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 it, it's kind of like and, and you'll know because uh, our uk readers and and, and listeners etc know the great grand designs channel four series yeah. that they come in and and sometimes they'll buy a, a house and you think well that house looks kind of cool why don't you just extend that house but then then they sort of just destroy it all and start again. It's very hard to get to that decision whereby, yeah, I have to destroy and I'm just looking at it from the plot of land and then I'm going again. Uh, most entrepreneurs get real prickly and get real nervous when that happens because ultimately 
that means the business stops evolving for that little period of time where they have to rebuild. They may not have enough money to parallel team it out. So therefore, uh, they have to make do with what they've got. And this is why private equity typically... Well, no, that's really interesting. So actually, Alan, I suggest that there's almost two tracks for this conversation, aren't there? There's the... There's the pre-sale phase of entrepreneurship, and it sounds like what you're saying is sort of tacitly endorsing, just make that shit work, right? Like for the first, like when a founder yeah. starts a business, is, in your view, even though your book is all about the best practice of running a technology organization, to some extent, would you say it's sort of okay that as long as you can support the sales that you've sold as an entrepreneurial-led organization, it's kind of okay to stick it together and make it work as long as when you, when the company grows up, maybe with a change of ownership, then you move on to that different track. Or would you say to entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, really, if you could do it properly the first time, you probably should? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. <laughs> the, the problem gets when you are duct taping it, but you convince yourself that is the best solution. Right? You're in complete denial. <laughs> that yeah, yeah. Don't, don't be putting too much weight on the table <laughs> it, it's not going to cope right <laughs> as long as everybody's going in it with that mindset then yes it's okay because at the end of the day you need a successful business it don't matter if you've got the best platform if you don't have the right customers and the business isn't fluid with cash flow it, it it's it's a moot conversation right so at an early start of a company yes cash is king customers is king renewable income is king and whatever you need to do to make your platform work just do it now hindsight's a wonderful thing and any entrepreneur and any any cto that's gone through that phase they all know themselves which bits they wouldn't do again that it's so much easier to do when the house is all laid bare and you can put in the plumbing and you put in the, the electric cables instead of ripping open walls again to go after it so therefore those those people have got a, their second company is usually in a much better state than the first company was. Hence, hence, and hence me buying your book, right? Before starting my next thing. <laughs> exactly. Because it's just a couple of little things. And I think, as NASA once said, you know, a half a degree off leaving the earth is enough to miss the moon, <laughs> right? But it's a small thing that would have been easy to correct at the start, but Jesus, when I get close to the moon, I ain't going to get to it. So it's the same thing here. Now, to answer your question, uh, yes, it's okay because when a private equity company comes in or an investment group comes in, they aren't coming in with their eyes blinkered, okay? They're coming in with their eyes wide open, and, and that's part of the diligence process at all aspects of a company is figuring out what is it we're buying, okay? <laughs> What do I really have? Which is why it's horrendously important to be honest with your potential buyer. Oh, interesting. You never want to hide anything from them because the last thing you want to do is pretend that the organization is a well-run, well-oiled machine. They come in and they realize it's belching out smoke at the back okay. here and think, shit, I have to replace the engine. You've already lost the mistrust between your investment group and your management group. What, are, what else are you hiding? What else have you not told us now that we've bought this? So I'm always a big believer in being honest and open uh, because what we're doing, particularly from the PE side of the fence, is we're looking at that company and thinking, brilliant idea, brilliant market space. They've got a significant uh, 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 market uh, uh, capture. Technology, mm, that, that ain't going to work. We're, we're going to have to redo that one. But we'll put money in at the start and invest knowing that we have to rebuild that out. We sometimes have to build out the back office because their accounting system, which was run on Excel, isn't going to grow, right? So we need to put in, say, QuickBooks or Sage or uh, NetSuite from that perspective. Or the sales organization needs a little bit more modernization because everything needs the, the owner of the company to be to close the sale. And we can't scale a company if it's one person that's always there that's doing the negotiations. So every part of the ecosystem has to sort of grow up right. and grow beyond a single person in order for it to grow. And technology, the good news there is it can always be solved. Right, so we never get ourselves into a problem whereby it's just an impossible situation. 
if you've managed to grow a business based on whatever stack, whatever language, whatever it is you're doing, however clunky it is, can always be replaced. That's exciting, isn't no it? Problem. I'll tell you what's interesting. So as you talk about rebuilding platforms and things, one of the things that tortured me for my Yapster journey, my SaaS business was eight years all in all. And I would say six years of that was utterly miserable in terms of forecasting well, revenue, but that's that's another topic. But forecasting products deliverables. In your book, you, you talk about um, the development process. How how do you think about shipping product kind of to the right quality roughly on time? Like, are you fairly prescriptive with your boards in terms of when you expect stuff to land? Or do you give yourself quite a lot of latitude? Because I think that's something a lot of first-time founders struggle with, right? They appoint their, their best mate as their CTO, and then they promise customers a whole bunch of stuff. And then they just pray to God that the tech team ship it roughly when they said they were going to. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, it's always a, it's more art than science, to be quite honest with you. Uh, everybody gets it late. And, you know, <laughs> we just need to look at the world's richest man to realize that even Tesla does not get products out in time. I mean, we're still waiting for the cyber truck. We're still waiting for the supercar, etc. He, he's he's the classic never delivers, but always promises salesperson. So, software is plagued with this. There's no doubt about it. My my take on it is stop delivering big, start delivering small. Mm. Release small, release often. And that that's a hard thing to get into because sometimes there are areas where you just need to get a good chunk done in order to unlock the next phase of it. What you never want to get into, and that's where it has to be a very close partnership with the CEO, is building a particular feature or a milestone that is too far away that the business is being hampered with sales and they can't close deals or they're starting to lose the loyalty and the goodwill of customers because you're you're in the Elon Musk situation of you're never delivering, but you're always promising. Right. Okay. And and that's a very hard thing to get back well, out well, of. And, and it's and, best at least that you, you don't get into it. Totally. In the first place. And at least if you're Elon Musk, you might have delivered one or two successful models to buy you a little bit of time. Whereas when you're the average yes. first time founder with your small subscale startup, you don't have any of that goodwill in the bank, do you? No, and that's why you need a couple of really close partners or customers whereby you maybe not even be charging them, but they're there more as your beta testers to, to really flesh out uh, what's needed, what doesn't work. And again, I think a lot of a lot of sort of particularly young startups, they're led by what they think the customer wants you know they think ah, this this needs all these shining bells and whistles whereas if they truly had the empathetic view of what the customer needed they probably only need to deliver 20 percent of what they were aiming for because that's all the customer's really going to use on a day-to-day -day basis yeah for sure okay everything else is just fluff or window dressing that may evolve to a core feature at a later date but are you actually solving the original problem that we we're trying to get after? Alan, to what extent, you talk in your book a lot about the need for a CTO to have a vision. Does this overlap in any way with the context of vision or have I misunderstood that? Yes, no, it does. It does. But again, the, the vision is in support of what the CEO's vision is. Can you give me an example of what, okay. what a CEO's vision might be and then what a corresponding CTO's vision might be? Uh, so a CEO vision may decide that they want to, oh, let's think about this. Uh, there's different market spaces, but let me give you an example of one of our portfolios at the moment. Say, for example, they want to provide a given service within the three adjoining states of where they're located. And they want to make sure that all of their customers are no more than 20 minutes drive away from the location. Okay. Okay, so we've got a various uh, number of healthcare type businesses from therapy to eye surgery to ear and nose and throat, etc. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the criteria is we, we, we want to make sure that we're, we're nowhere geographically, they're, they're located quickly. So that's the CEO's vision. So the technologist's vision has got to be, how are we going to build a platform to make sure that we are coordinated and that, that we can actually reach and achieve the CEO's vision of being within this 
close. So therefore, the decisions that we're making, the, the products that we're building, has got to be in full support of that. Now, the vision at some point, once we're successful there, he's clearly going to say, we're going to expand that now to multiple states. We're going to go elsewhere. Okay, so the vision has got to think ahead of the CEO in a number of areas to figure out, okay, now that he says we're going to go to the full eastern board of the US, do I have to go back to the drawing board here or can my vision evolve to cope with that? That may be somewhat of a contrived example, given you, you hit me on the spot with that one, but uh, the, the, the premise is still the same. Am I choosing the right technical stack? Am I choosing the right team? Am I choosing the right architectural design patterns that will in actual fact support the businesses where they're needing to go? Another example may be that uh, the CEO says, we want to get a closer relationship with our partners so that they can be a lot more self-serve. Great. A technologist hears that and screams, I got to provide APIs, right? In order for us to integrate with third parties, then I got to be able to either call their APIs or have them call my APIs. So from that perspective, my vision is to build a microservice API driven architecture that can keep up with the scale of the business. So everything that we deliver has got to be in pursuit of creating that set of APIs that's well documented, that's well secured, it's logged, it's got audit trails, it's got billable stuff if we're going to charge people in the number of times they call us, et cetera. That's the technologist's vision. Now, the CEO can look at that and say, holy crap, that, that's a phenomenal, now I can sell this. This is something that will actually help me grow my company. Alex, how would you recommend a first time non-technical founder validate that their CTO's vision, technology vision, is in fact going to be able to service the CEO's higher vision? I'll tell you, the reason I ask you, I'll be specific, so I'll confess some of my own sort of dirty laundry. Yep. When we founded Japster, right, it was all about being a GDPR compliant, secure mobile communication system for frontline people who mm. typically didn't get access to Office 365 or whatever, right? And so the challenge was we needed to build a, a consumer grade communication product that also had kind of enterprise security features and integrations. And um, yep. at the time, React Native, the, the, uh, the platform popularized by Facebook that, of course, now supports desktop, Android, um, iPhone, lots of consumer products are built on that. At the time, didn't support uh, desktop, I think, and we thought we needed to be across three. So we picked, um, my co-founder CTO picked Cordova. And, and, and we built a, a pretty good business, and we're proud of what we did. But the thing that always held us back was that we, we couldn't quite get to the true consumer grade experience that we kind of pictured when we envisaged the business at the beginning because the technical limitations just meant that like it was never going to catch it was never going to feel consumer like yeah. to the end users because none of the consumer products they were using in their personal life were built on on cordova um as a non-technical founder is there any way that i could have known that or been a better partner to my co-founder to sort of help him through some of those technical decisions because i feel like he was a better partner to me interrogating some of my sales and marketing ideas because you didn't need to be a sales and marketing expert. You could just be intelligent to have an informed view. Whereas I felt like I never added any value to him helping him think through some technology decisions. Well, I think, I mean, that's always a hard, hard one to answer that one, Rob. But I would say that in your heart, you knew you didn't have that consumer-based quality, okay? So from that perspective, as the CTO, I would have kept asking you, then who's your benchmark? Who's which app is the one that you consider to be consumer grade that I should be oh, aiming that's for? And Craig did say that to me, to be fair, and I said WhatsApp. Okay, that's fair dues. So because then then I would have said, great, we can we probably don't have the budget and we don't have the skill sets at this precise moment to do native apps for Android and iOS in order to get us to that full stuff. Because that's that's effectively two separate development teams. What I've given you now is a watered down version that will work across both platforms without having to redevelop specific for each platforms. So what I've given you now is effectively a proof of concept. It's enough for us to prove the business and to prove the nature of the stuff. And to go back to the original question, a good vision from both the CTO and the CEO, they should sort of egg each other on, you know? right? Because you'll say, 
here's where I want to go. And he'll say, well, I'm going to get you to here. And you'll go, wow, well, shit. Well, if I get to here, then I can get to here. Because you've unlocked more possibilities for do, me. Do you know what's, you know what's so interesting, there. Alan? He, he, he did, in fact, do everything that you suggested he should. I and mean, you know what's interesting Rather than really hearing what he was saying, it's a bit like how customers always gave me some really interesting insights that at the time I thought I was listening to, but now when I look back, I wasn't listening nearly as well as I should have done. And actually, <laughs> what Craig said, we could have pivoted into being a learning platform and an HR system that then would have meant that we didn't have to match consumer grade experience for the messaging components because we would have gone into a different territory. Or we could have sought to raise a gazillion dollars and maintain native teams to be a pure play communication platform that was closer to WhatsApp. I, as CEO, have to live with the fact that I didn't do either of those things. I just plowed on through, I just plowed on through the middle trying to be a pure, pure play messaging system on angel funding, right? That then wasn't able to go right. and rebuild or move on to the platforms that could deliver that. And so it's quite confronting, but it's interesting to hear you kind of role play and say to me what a great CTO would and should have said in that situation, realizing that he did in fact say that, and I'm the fucking idiot that didn't listen and change the strategy. Well, I, I didn't want to point the finger there, Rob, but since the finger seems to be wiggling in your general direction, uh, yeah, and I think, but 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 again, it speaks to the partnership of both of those roles is is making sure that that each one is keeping the other right. one honest, right? And and but. You had a different objective, <clears throat> so you cannot be held f fault there either. But again, it's it's that maybe you needed a mentor that was outside to say, okay, Rob, you need to get to this position before we start talking about this level first. Now, what what do we need to do to get to this level? And yeah, you're an angel funding, etc. Maybe there was a point where you'd say, right, well, let's get in private equity or let's get in VC funding. Two different routes, two different pass but fundamentally they are external help that sort of been there and done it not on your specific product but in terms of building and growing and scaling a company i.e they're not scared of the large numbers to bring in investment and say right well okay you clearly need two teams to do blah 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 we're going to fund that and here's what the money is because we know how much this usually costs so don't stress about the fact that oh shit i'm spent spend two million dollars on development for the next three years that seems a big number to you, but to those guys, it's nothing because that's they know what it takes. Well, and they to get can see the different paths to success as well, can't they? I mean, one of the things Craig and I laugh about now is 18 months after founding Yapster, where we had very, very limited functionality, um, a business called Superdry. You might do you know the brand Superdry, that Supergroup? <laughs> Yeah, so actually, Super, yeah. Supergroup rolled us out internationally across 5,000 employees across about 50 countries. And um, we were like hot building, like basic um, notification functionality. We added the sort of Instagram style newsfeed after the thing had been rolled out across these 50 countries. And at the time we were just so desperately just trying to keep up rather than thinking, Christ, this is a signal that we could be really onto something here. We should go speak to somebody that's done this before, has got deeper pockets than we have, that can help us take some of the chaos out of this early success. Yeah, yeah. And that's what, I mean, for the, the subtle difference between VC and, and private equity is that VC is more of a, we're going to roll the dice because you haven't proven yourself yet and we only need one in a hundred to be successful. PE is more of a, we need one in every, we need all hundred to be successful. Uh, we're not betting on anything. We're investing in a sure thing. I, you've established customers, you've established a market space. There is growth. And there's a lot more runway that you haven't even begun to explore. That's where PE is going there. Now, it's always a good litmus test that when you get to a certain level, if you start shopping yourself around PE firms, getting yourself a good investment banker to do that, if nobody's taking your calls, then they're clearly seeing something that you're not. And, and maybe, maybe you're just too right. far. Because they're out. not stupid, are they? They're not stupid, but sometimes they don't often right. take a big risk. You know, PE wouldn't have got involved in, say, Uber or Dropbox because those are perfect examples of where you need the network effect to kick in. Uber doesn't work if there's only one taxi driver in the in the city. It, it needs a significant amount of investment in order right. to build up the network. Same thing with Airbnb and those type of companies where you see 
I need a large user base to be able to make this thing work. PE's well, because their, their own investors are quite. We'll be interested it. once. It's yeah, their own established. investors are really demanding as well, yeah. aren't they? So it's not just that they're being jerks; it's that they can't be taking punts. No, no, and PE's usually coming from like a school endowments, pension funds. They're they're the real sort of uh, powerhouse when it comes to investment. I.e., you don't lose that money, uh, and we make sure that. We try everything to make sure that we don't. So let's that assume that some of the people listening are interested in building up their business and selling it to private equity. A couple of areas from your book that jumped out at me that I thought was sort of interesting and, and instructive. Um, dealing with boards, because I guess whether you're a CTO or whether you're the co you're the founder CEO, dealing with the private equity board is probably quite different to what you've done previously, right? A little bit intimidating, yes. It can be a little bit intimidating, but uh, we like to think of that as if it's intimidating to you, then you're probably looking at it from the wrong angle. The board is usually once a quarter and it's a wonderful checkpoint for everybody to make sure that we're still heading in the right direction. We're still going in the right, because sometimes you get, we see this in our daily lives all the time. We have great goals as to what we're going to do. And then daily life kicks in. And before you know it, two weeks has gone by or three weeks has gone by and the, the kitchen table that I was going to rebuild is still sitting there, not touched, or the garden hasn't been done, etc. It's the same thing at a company level, just at different, different uh, magnitudes of of of, of uh, growth. We get caught up in the daily grind of running the business. We sometimes forget about running and managing and evolving the business, and a board is a good check in every so often to make sure that hey. Are we still going after those big goals that we're going after? What what changed? What didn't get there? And from a PE perspective, yes, you're playing with other people's money, so therefore we have to keep a check on the check on the, <laughs> on literally the checks uh, to make sure that the spending is going in the right direction, the revenue is going in the right direction. Why haven't we hit those goals? Is there a good reason for that? Is this a short-term thing or have we discovered something a little bit more ooh, epidemic? So you're always evaluating and sometimes the CEO or the founder, if they don't have that level of check, they'll convince themselves things are a lot right, healthier than they really are. They have the <laughs> Del Poy mentality. Okay? We'll be millionaires tomorrow. We'll be millionaires tomorrow. Tell you right? what, don't name any names. I know you couldn't anyway, but... Um, but have you ever seen people really fail to adjust to a private equity run sort of board culture? Like what, what does that look like when yes. a CEO or a CTO just cannot hack it in a private equity backed board environment? Well, here's, here's the, here's the sort of uh, the, the harsh reality of it is we kind of don't tolerate that. it for too long and then you're removed. Okay. And, and, and that's not, that's not because we're suddenly bullies or we're sort of stuff here. Again, it's, it's about, having empathy for the PE firm. So <laughs> somebody has given the PE firm a large chunk of money to invest in a fund to make the money back, right? It's that simple. If you were to write a million dollar check and give it to somebody else to invest, you want that person to take as much care and as diligent over that Absolutely. spend as possible. You don't want them going, I'll be fine. I'm, exactly. I'm sure they know what they're doing. They'll, they'll, exactly. they'll figure what out. What does that look like in <laughs> practice? Because, of course, the listeners to this are going to be founders rather than private equity funds. And, you know, for some of them, they probably shouldn't sell to private equity if they don't have really what it takes to if they want to carry on participating. What does that look like then when somebody just falls behind them before they get removed? Uh, you, you, uh, you literally get told well, because like, well, so basically they come to a board meeting, the numbers don't look right. It's excuses, excuses, excuses. It's awkward. And the board director just says, this just isn't good enough. I'm, I'm sorry, but we're going to need to change. Is it just, is it not much more to say than that? It, 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 it can happen. It can, it can happen as, as, as quickly as that. It can also happen before the board happens. Uh, but again, from a PE perspective, we generally hold a company for yeah. three to not five not years. Really. Okay, not long at all, and that actually that that goes very quickly. Now we've got two or three stages inside of that, which which we can go into a separate Love podcast. To actually, go into that because it's quite interesting from that perspective. But ultimately, we don't have time to wait 
to happen. So if something's not happening in the first year, we usually have a, a bit of a gut check, a litmus test to see, is this the right team? Oh my God, and that must be so hard year? for a sort of super cerebral engineer type. I can only imagine the cultural shock. Usually though, in all fairness, the CTOs are the, are the we have the least, <sighs> we're, we're the least problematic <laughs> at the board level. Un- un- unpack that, what do you mean by right? that? <laughs> Right. By the time by the time the CTO gets fired, then something has horrendously so, so gone who, wrong. Who's being held okay. accountable at board level for the CTO's performance? Then that's interesting. CEO. Oh, the CEO has to be held responsible. He, they are at the, at the end of the day. But the CFO and the CFO are they're the two strongest right. pieces on the chessboard, and they're the ones that are ultimately responsible for everything. Then it's usually the CTO and the marketing and the sales chiefs at that point. Uh, but again, but again, if the company is a technology-based company, then of course the CTO has right. more responsibility. But if the company, say, a service-based company and technology plays a part in that, then there's a bit more latitude regarding the CTO. But if the CTO doesn't have the vision and is not keeping up or is holding the business back, the CTO will be told. And if they don't get significant changes or demonstrate that they are heading in the right direction, then they it's will be replaced. I think one of the things that I found fascinating okay. as I sort of matured as a first time founder was understanding the role that how business continuity sort of disaster recovery planning can actually kind of help you with holding the organization accountable plays into the, your point about documentation in the book, right? <laughs> that you can, as the CEO responsible for putting the right people in the right seats and then making them perform, you really don't want to get yourself in a position where you actually can't let someone go when they're not performing because you have no idea how they do what they do and nor would a capable successor. Oh, Can you talk a little bit about that? Completely. Yeah. I mean, that. I, I, I mean, first, companies coming into the PE space, we get this all the time. We, we, you know, we, we, right. get, we call it key man insurance, which is basically who are, the, who are the handful of people that really knows how this business runs and without them, <laughs> we'd be humped. Right. And and they're the guys that, that A, have maybe got the deep relationships with the clients and the clients have said, I'm only ever dealing with Rob. If Rob goes and I'm, I'm taking my business elsewhere. Right. So there's that side of the fence. And then you've got the technology side of the fence, which and we've all been here. There's that one guy that he's the only Takes one that knows how to on redo that server. Takes his laptop. He can't even go on holiday. <laughs> right. And that's your litmus test. Can your key engineers not all at the same time, but can any one of them leave for two weeks without a laptop and this business still succeeds? If the answer is no, right, and you're then describing you've got about a 80% of startups as well, which is funny. Of course it is. And that's okay because that's part of the evolution to get there. So again, it's okay, but you got to get to a point where you say, this is no longer acceptable, guys. We're, we've got like a hundred people who's relying on this company's output right. to pay their salaries, to pay their bills, to uh. put their children through school. <laughs> we can't mess this up. And what if your laptop dies? Are you telling me we're completely humped? So yes, we truly have to get ourselves to an evolution of where somebody has to say, stop. I need to get this right. Now, Everybody that's been through it before and they go at the second company, they put in the small breadcrumbs along the way to make sure they don't get to this horrendous pivot point whereby they're saying, oh, shit, I've got a lot of catch up to do in terms of housekeeping. Uh, But the first time person that comes along, they're just caught up in the passion and the excitement of getting shit done that they forget about some of this stuff. And to them, restarting a handful of servers and they know which order they have to do it in and da 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 it's like sneezing for them. They don't uh, even it's so think funny. about it. One of the things I found is that once you started taking QA documentation, once you started taking that stuff seriously, at first it was really hard because you realize you're paying like a 20%, what feels like a 20% productivity tax. I guess it's like all forms of debt, right? But like, once you just start factoring that yeah. in, it's so, it puts you in so much happier place as as a non technical founder CEO. Oh, completely. And and here's the thing that I always ask my engineers and 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 also CEOs is picture yourself lying in a hospital bed, and you're hooked up to a life support machine. If that life support machine goes wrong, you're dead. Okay. 
Do you want your engineering team maintaining <laughs> that life support machine? And to the engineer, do you want your code <laughs> writing that in that stuff? And then the others go, no, no, I don't. Take me off of it. I'll take my chances. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because people generally don't think about the consequences of stuff going wrong. Yes, most businesses' lives will not be lost. However, customers will be lost. Revenue will go down. Jobs will be lost. Lives will be affected. So yeah, there's a trickle down. That's a worst case scenario. But everything has. It's the butterfly effect. Everything has a consequence. So you're right. Once you get that level of QA, that level of documentation, that level of reliability, we're producing a product that people can actually build their business on top of. Because if we go down, that means that company has gone down. We, we can't accept that. Now, can you imagine if AWS was built with some of the go lucky type, you know, that some of our engineers sometimes play with? It, it, it would be a disaster. Or if Netflix was like that, and every time you went to look at a Netflix stuff, it would, it would just crash. Uh, hold on, I need to go. And, I'm going to reboot the Netflix server. Don't worry, it'll be back up in two seconds. I, I think it's interesting. I think a that. lot of non-technical founders they um, they make do to begin with. Then they get used to being the front person for investors, employees, customers, <clears throat> and they sort of get used to covering, defending the indefensible. And then that becomes, that actually becomes a habit. It's why I'm telling everybody that I know that's in this space to read your book, because it's the first step to me in sort of beginning to understand how to free yourself from using your willpower and charisma to defend the indefensible, at least when it comes to technology. Yeah. And, and it, you know, you never want to get to a state where you're pointing fingers, <clears throat> but you do have to point the finger back at yourself and say, okay, well, maybe I've got the wrong person in the role. Maybe that person isn't servicing me and my needs for the business today. They were yesterday because the business was in a different state yesterday. But today, hmm, you haven't grown with the business. So therefore, they're... and again, this happens all the time, particularly at the CEO level. What we find is that the CEO that bootstrapped a company from zero dollars to like a $50 million company, that's a skill set, huge skill set. They've done phenomenally well. That skill set does not mean that they're going to be able to take a, a $50 million company and turn it into a $500 million company because that's a whole different set of problems, a whole different set of scalability, a whole different set of regulations and all that sort of stuff. So maybe we need a CEO that's more apt in that space, but it's no ding on the one that took us from zero to 50 because that's what they do. It's the same thing with technologists. You know, the CTO of Amazon isn't probably right. the guy you want to do a startup with. Right. And, and likewise, the startup CTO isn't the one you want to be running Amazon. Right. Everybody's got their sort of defined space. Now you can always argue, how the hell do I get to that space? Of because you evolve up, you grow up. Well, that's interesting. And so I suppose involved. for again for first time founders listening that that do have a fantastic entrepreneurial CTO that maybe doesn't want to or isn't going to be able to become the sort of CTO that you articulate in your book. Actually, having that conversation early on and kind of defining what they love and are good at, you can actually create career pathways. They can be a sort of what Ivan, you know, a tech visionary or something that's actually quite different to being the CTO, I assume, when they get to that scale. Yeah, and, and it's funny because, and, and I'm sure you had this problem as well when you were, we were looking at it, the cap table of a founding company is usually a mess by the time you start bringing in PE and all that sort of stuff. You're thinking, right, we're, we're, we're going to have to write certain checks to get certain people away because this cap table is nowhere near right to go forth and to take the business to the next evolution. Why does the CTO have 80% of the company? Because <laughs> I couldn't afford his salary. Yeah, but still, wow. Yeah, okay. It, 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 it's, it's interesting. I think it's one of the benefits of being a second timer that you, you, you can think a little bit more about the whole life cycle of the company and plan accordingly. Of course, one of the problems as a second timer is you can see all of the pitfalls that you might fall in and die in, and therefore you get much more reluctant to pull the trigger. So there is some magic in a first timer. 
Yeah, more, you're you're more risk aversive at that point. Yeah, I get it. I mean, it's, 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 Rob, there's no magic bullet to this stuff. Otherwise, everybody would be doing it. As I say, I do recommend to everybody that they they buy and read your book. And similarly, advice goes out to all listeners here. Um, we've obviously become friends because of my shameless fan mail to begin with. Are you happy for people to? Well, if people read the book and they like it, what is the best way to follow you and engage with you? Just hop over to alan.is and then you'll get my LinkedIn and my emails and all of that stuff from there on in. And I think I've shamelessly plugged it all over the book as well. So you'll be able to find it. But Rob, it was an absolute pleasure and I'm looking forward to many other conversations with you.